Hello, I'm the National Skills Commissioner, Adam Boyton. Before I begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. At last year's conference, as Interim Commissioner, I spoke of the NSC's aims, specifically to develop robust intelligence on Australia's labour market, our workforce, and our current emerging and future workforce skills needs. I said that we would use both traditional and new data sources and techniques, big data and machine learning approaches, as well as those more traditional economic and skills analysis, which will ultimately uh, come together in a report each year setting out the skills needs of Australia. I'm pleased to share with you today the work that we have been doing to date and it provides some insights on the current and emerging trends in the labour market. First of all though, I want to talk about vocational education and training and our work in pricing vet qualifications. As you probably know, the Commission is tasked with developing and maintaining a set of efficient prices for vet courses through examining the cost drivers for courses and the different public and private returns. We have a phased approach for this work. Something I've often repeated is the core to this is a consideration of quality though. An efficient price does not mean the lowest price, rather it means the optimal price to secure training that delivers students with the skills employers need and sets them up for a valuable career. We are now some way down the track to delivering on this work, with our first report on VET average price benchmarks being released just a few months ago. The development of average price benchmarks involved the first national collection of information on VET's qualifications, subsidies, fees and prices across Australia. The data we collected confirms there is substantial variation in fees and subsidies, and therefore total prices, even for a standard government funded student studying the same qualification. Now typically, the average price for a VET qualification is $7,700. For a certificate level three, the average is $9,200, and for a diploma, it's around $12,000. Across all qualifications, on average, we found students paid 13% of the total price for an apprenticeship or traineeship, or 24% otherwise, that is for a non-apprenticeship or traineeship. But the range of what percentage students can be paying is large, from 0% to 62% for an apprenticeship or traineeship, and from 0% to 72% otherwise. This will be no surprise to this audience, but we observe varying prices for students accessing the same qualification in different jurisdictions. On average, the difference is more than $3,000, and in many cases as much as $10,000, where more than one jurisdictional price is observed. So what drives this variation across the country? Primarily it's driven by policy decisions, Taken at state and territory levels regarding which courses, which students and which providers they want to most direct funding to. Jurisdictions also have adopted very different approaches to regulating student fees, from fixed fees in New South Wales to unregulated fees in other areas. To add to our data, we have also been surveying RTOs about the costs of delivering training for our fish and cost study. Again, this is the first national exercise to document the full range of training delivery costs encountered by training providers. So far, we've captured over 30% of subsidised training activity and are currently analysing the data. We're working closely with states and territories as we look to finalise our approach to estimating recommended fees, prices and subsidies, hopefully by the end of this year. We're also doing some analysis on similarities between VET courses across and within training packages there are over 1,000 training package qualifications listed on the National Register, so this work involves analysing vast amounts of text using natural language processing, which is a branch of machine learning, to calculate similarity scores for each qualification to other qualifications across all training packages. We're looking at the similarity not just across the course names, of course, but the units within the course, the course descriptions, the frequency of keywords within these texts, and so on. This analysis was able to cluster qualifications around the similarity of skills taught by the units within the courses. Not surprisingly, 
many of these clusters mirror the existing training packages. However, we did see some other interesting patterns emerge. For example, we found some of the clusters intersected, which could indi indicate some degree of overlap across these training packages. This piece of exploratory work will soon be available as a beta release on the NSC website. You'll be able to search for a qualification and see which other qualifications could be considered similar. The results can be filtered by level and training package, and what you can also see is what is contributing to that similarity score. Is it the course name, the description, the units, or so on? We'll continue to refine and build on this preliminary analysis, which will ultimately assist in, in helping to streamline the VET system, building a richer picture of the training market, and deepening the current understanding of the links between jobs, skills, and training. Another innovative part of the VET work we are doing is on the development of the VET national data asset. Working in partnership with the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the VET national data asset will enable us to assess the performance of the VET system with much greater depth and accuracy. It does that because it links total VET activity data to data on employment, earnings, income support and participation in further education and training. This data is of course anonymised or de-identified and can only be accessed in a highly secure environment developed and maintained by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. To date, the ability to monitor the outcomes of VET courses in the labour market has been limited by the data available. The fragmented nature of the VET system introduces further difficulties. You'd be well aware that there are more than 1,200 nationally recognised qualifications, 600 accredited courses delivered by more than 4,000 registered training organisations. Each state and territory has a responsibility for its own system of subsidised delivery, introducing a further source of variation. The impacts of education and training on a person's quality of life can only be observed after the training is ended, and sometimes not for years afterwards. So disentangling the effects of the training from other factors, such as the student's aptitude, attitude, background, characteristics and labour market experience, as well as general community and economic effects, requires careful use of statistical techniques. There are a number of outcomes of interest from this type of research, and the required data for analysis seems to be readily available. These are income, employment status, contribution to industry, especially industries experienced experiencing skill shortages, reliance on income support and participation in further education and training. The National Skills Commission, in collaboration with the Bureau of Statistics, is developing a risk-adjusted methodology which will be refined based on stakeholder feedback, expert input and the quality and usefulness of the data. It will be particularly important to ensure that the final results focus on the value add of the training. The methodology must also control for the range of student characteristics and local economic factors that have a large influence on an individual's job outcome. Our initial outputs are already indicating that we'll be able to generate much deeper insights than are possible with existing data sources. The NSC is engaging with the VET sector to make sure we take into account your priorities and concerns as we continue this work, and I'd like to thank everyone who is working with us on this exciting project. Now I thought I'd also spend some time just giving a brief overview of what's been happening in the labour market and what our five-year employment projections are suggesting. Obviously the pandemic had a big impact on Australia's labour market but the good news is that the jobs recovery in Australia is incredibly strong. Indeed at 5.1 per cent the unemployment rate is back below where it was when the pandemic first hit and jobs growth has been incredibly strong with over 115,000 jobs created in the month of May alone. Our own data, which we release each month, shows that online job ads have also recovered really strongly. In fact, they're at a 12-year high. And our most recent survey of employers found that around 21% of employers in May said they were looking to increase staff. These are all really positive signs. However, and indeed one of the consequences of this success in recovering jobs is that we are now starting to see shortages of workers affecting a number of industries. Agriculture and construction are two that come, come to mind. When we step back though from those macro trends, 
What our data and research shows is that some of the more detailed underlying trends that were evident before COVID-19 have accelerated. These are structural shifts such as the ongoing move towards services industries and sectors and within that the care sector in particular and the importance of higher skill level occupations uh, in driving the jobs recovery, something that in turn underscores the importance of a post-secondary education. We're also seeing ongoing robust percentage growth in employment across STEM occupations. And of course, there is an ongoing challenging employment outlook for routine manual occupations, that is, the sorts of jobs that the machines can do. And bearing those structural changes in mind, we've recently released five-year employment projections showing our expectations for growth across around 250 occupations over the period to November 2025. The objective in releasing these projections is not to claim with absolute certainty that employment of aged and disabled carers, for example, will increase by 54,700 or 24.7 per cent, nor is it to claim with absolute certainty that employment of registered nurses will increase by 46,500, or that software and applications programmers will see their ranks swell by 46,100. That said, those are our best estimates. However, the use of such forecasts ought to go beyond that really literal interpretation and focus on some of the big shifts and dynamics at play. In that regard, our projections suggest that employment growth will be strongest across skill level one occupations, that is typically requiring a bachelor's degree or higher, followed by employment across skill level four occupations, typically commensurate with a certificate level two or three. We also find STEM related occupations are likely to see around double the growth of non-STEM occupations. Manufacturing and information media and telecommunications are two industries that on our projections are contracting, although let's be clear, parts of the manufacturing sector such as chemicals and primary metals manufacturing will continue to grow. So there are pockets of growth even in those sectors that might in aggregate be shrinking. Our report on the 25 emerging occupations in Australia is a further illustration of some of these trends. This report found that jobs will grow in digital technology and data science and architecture. Online engagement such as user experience analysts and social media specialists. Sustainability engineering and trades. And then there are those new business practices such as agile and logistics analysts, new regulatory roles such as energy auditors and new areas within health such as biostatisticians and respiratory therapists. The recurring theme here is that the emerging jobs of today and the jobs of the future will all require higher skill levels than just a post-secondary education. And employees are likely to continually need to refresh their skills and retrain throughout their careers. The National Skills Commission's new skills priority list, which has just been released, provides a current labour market rating for around 800 800 occupations nationally. So that's, is it in shortage now or not? It also outlines the predicted likely demand for those jobs over the coming five years, strong, moderate or soft. We identify 50 occupations in shortage now and that also have strong future demand. This includes occupations like welders, locksmiths, ICT security specialists, and also those occupations in the care sector, aged carers and disabled carers. In developing the list, the NSC engaged with more than 300 groups around Australia and received around 120 submissions from peak bodies, industry groups, professional associations, unions and regional representative bodies. And of course, we're open to receiving further feedback. And I'd like to thank you for the part you played in this important piece of analysis and the publication, which is the backbone of our labour market advice and will be produced annually. I find I'm often talking about the things that we're working on. So it's really gratifying to be able to speak about something we just released a few months ago, which I hope will create a paradigm shift in the way we view the market and the way we view skills needs. The Australian skills classification was released in beta form in March. And with it, we are changing the idea of how we define jobs. Rather than simply thinking about jobs in an occupational lens, we're starting to think about the skills that sit within those jobs. And the way we do this is to deconstruct around 600 occupations into three areas. Core competencies, 
Those are things like employability skills or soft skills, specialist tasks, which sit within individual jobs and technology tools, the computers and the software we need to do our jobs each day. Let me address each of those separately in a little more detail. Ten core competencies are common to all jobs. Things like teamwork, problem solving, literacy and numeracy. A 2019 survey conducted by forerunner elements to the National Skills Commission found that 75% of employers considered employability skills to be as, if not more important, than technical skills. The specialist tasks I mentioned earlier are the work activities a person undertakes specific to a job. They change more frequently than core competencies and are really useful for differentiating occupations. The Australian Skills Classification identifies 1,925 different specialist tasks. We also identified 88 technology tools such as software or hardware required in an occupation. Skills in the Australian Skills Classification that are similar are clustered together. So theoretically, if you can do one task in a skills cluster, you can also probably do the others. In other words, the Australian Skills Classification enables a systematic way of thinking about transferable skills. The benefit of this very granular view is to help employers to be less constrained by job titles and look more closely at what skills are required for a job. It also expands the possibilities for job seekers by clearly identifying skills that are transferable across occupations. As I mentioned, we are happy to receive feedback on the classification, which is available on our website. I know I've spoken a lot today about data, research and some of the programs and some of the analysis we have underway. Ultimately though, I think it's really important we come back to why it is we're doing it. And if I think about why or what underlies all of the analysis that the National Skills Commission is undertaking, the reports that we've released, the information we will be releasing, it comes back to this. I really think the value we can add and the benefit we can offer Australia and Australians is to, help make, is to help individuals, to help governments, to help RTOs, to help the VET sector as a whole make better decisions based on data to get people a greater chance of get, getting a job, a better outcome for training and ultimately a stronger, more productive economy. Thank you.